Hello everybody. Tonight's topic, today's topic, is the unification of Italy and Germany. We've been speaking for about a week now about nationalism as a political ideology and how it triumphed in the 19th century and ended up spreading all over the world and becoming the most important political ideology and in fact remains one of the most important political ideologies into the 20th century. The unification in Italy and Germany are held up as these big examples of that triumph. And so we're going to look at the specific details of those two countries' unifications. In front of you, you see a linguistic, an ethno-linguistic map of Europe. I've shown it to you before in class. But if you look at it, you might remember that this map, which shows the distribution of majority populations that are speaking a particular language or belong to a particular ethnic group, and you can see that they are um, concentrated in particular areas, areas you might recognize, Italy, Germany, which do not exist as political states at this point. Over here on the eastern side of Europe, you see a lot of different languages, a lot of diversity there, a lot of ethno-linguistic diversity. And look what's going on politically. This map, you see this map, shows the political boundaries of Europe in the mid-19th century. So you can see that there where you saw uh, concentration of Italian speakers, they're actually divided up into a lot of different states. And the same is true here in Germany. And where you saw a lot of ethno-linguistic diversity here in Eastern Europe, they're actually concentrated into two large states. So definitely the principle of nationalism is not being applied here. Uh, in fact, like I said, it's just now starting to really uh, catch fire in Europe in the 19th century. If you look at the Europe of 1871, you'll see that uh, now Germany and Italy, this is a political map, Your Germany and Italy have been united as uh, single states. The eastern portions of Europe remain, uh, you know, states with multilinguistic populations, more or less. That, too, will eventually change. Look at these maps uh, all together. You can see that you have uh, the ethno-linguistic map there on the left, uh, where the language and, and commonalities are illustrated. The political map, which does not use the principle of nationalism to organize these populations. And then finally on the bottom, Europe in 1871, after the unification of Italy and Germany. And you see that the map on the upper left is much more similar to the one um, on the bottom than it is to the one on the right. The unification of Italy was one of the most uh, important events of this time period. And you remember, maybe from the reading and discussions in class, that when nationalism was first um, promoted, it was a very liberal political ideal. Uh, it was power to the people. It was overthrowing absolutist monarchs, beheading a king and a queen. And the liberal p principles of uh, nationalism were very um, idealistic and, to some extent, somewhat romantic. So this is Giuseppe Mazzini. He's one of the most famous Italian nationalists, very prominent politician of his day, early 19th century. And this quote here from Mazzini sort of illustrates this, this vision that romantic nationalists in the early days had of what their project was about. Your country is the sign of the mission that God has given you to fulfill towards humanity. In the name of the love you bear your country, you must peacefully but untiringly combat the existence of privilege and inequality in the land that gave you life. You'll be reading some more about Mazzini uh, and some more of his writing. But this, is a, this, is, this represents his vision of, of what the Italian nation was, was going to try to achieve, something to, to bring equality to all, to uplift not just Italians, but the whole of humanity. This was a mission from God. And, uh, and this sort of represents the, 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 the liberal, romantic, idealist views of nationalism when it was born. Now, other nationalists by the mid-19th century and late 19th century for sure they saw the power of nationalism, the ideas that people had that, you know, that, that, that authority and legitimacy of government didn't come from God, that it actually came from the people. So some of them, some of these leaders, 
tried to figure out how to work with that to maintain and, um, and, and even seize power. This is Camilo Benso Conte di Cavour. He was the uh, prime minister of the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia, which was the largest in Italy on that peninsula that I showed you earlier. It was in the upper, the northern western side, and I'll be showing you a map later. Now, his vision of, of nationalism, um, also he thought that the Italians, all the Italian speakers, should be united in a state. But he had this idea that um, you really needed to just use political and diplomatic maneuvers to try to put this this state together. That uh, you know you had to to kind of work politically, um, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes covertly, sometimes overtly, to try to orchestrate a situation that would give power to the state. It wasn't about equality for people, or. A, you know, mission from God to uplift humanity. For them, it was about strengthening the Italian state or the wannabe Italian state. And this quote sort of explains what was going on in his mind. Since the search for an, a believable excuse for war presented our main problem, I felt obliged to treat that question before any others. He wrote this letter to the king of Sardinia and um, he's describing that he had had a meeting with Napoleon III. He was trying to figure out how to work with France um, against Austria. And they had to come up with what he called a believable excuse for war. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to get the Austrians out of the northern portion of where the Italian speakers live, because Austria controlled a lot of, uh, of Italy, at the, or northern Italy at the time. And so he wanted to figure out how to eject them. And he thought he needed to work with France to do that. And that's what he did. There had been, like I uh, also mentioned, uh, in, 18, in 1848, there were nationalist uprisings throughout Italy, uh, throughout Europe. And in Italy was one of those places. It had not succeeded, as it did not elsewhere. And Austria remained in control of a large portion of that territory in, in the north, like I said. The rest of the peninsula was divided into smaller kingdoms, which you can see here on the map. And that's the situation that um, Cavour is trying to address. Piedmont, Sardinia was, uh, Piedmont was ruled by Victor Emmanuel, and he chose Cavour, like I said, as his prime minister. And his goal was to free the Italians from Austrian control. I already said that, too. So he worked with France and Piedmont to go to war against Austria. They won, and they took Lombardy in exchange. Uh, they let France have the regions of Nice and Savoy, and the Austrians, however, did not uh, get out of Venetia. They got to keep that. But that's going to change. Okay, so in the north, Victor Emmanuel and, Camille, and, and Cavour are the two leaders that are uniting northern Italy. And in the south, the most famous of the nationalists was Giuseppe Garibaldi. Now, southern Italy was controlled many parts of it by the French, the Bourbon king of France. And so Giuseppe Garibaldi and others wanted to unite these different provinces and bring them together under Italian leadership. So he put together an army of people who wore red shirts. They were called the red shirts. Uh, you remember we talked about how, how what you wear communicates what group you belong to, and in this case, the red shirters were the members of Garibaldi's army. Like I said, parts of Italy were not um, run by Italians. They were run by the French. And uh, like I said, Venetia was given up to, um, to it, I told you that Venetia would go eventually to the Italians, and that happened in 1866 after the um, Austro-Prussian War, because Italy had been an ally of Prussia. We're going to talk in a few minutes about Prussia and the role of Prussia in the unification of Germany. But the Italians were on um, the side of the Prussians in a war against Austria, and so they got Venetia in 1866. Um, and then Italian forces went into the Papal States in 1870. Napoleon tried to, Napoleon III, I should say, he tried to defend but was unsuccessful. Um, he had also been distracted by the Franco-Prussian War. Like I said, I'll be getting to that shortly, so, um, to, to what happened in, uh, in Prussia. So he ended up losing the defense of the French, the French properties or the French states that the 
Fateat on the Italian peninsula. So finally, um, they ejected the French, they ejected the Austrians from the north and from the south, and eventually Garibaldi turned over the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies and, and the, the territories that he had been successful in liberating from foreign rule to Cavour, and the whole of uni Italy was united as, the, as a constitutional monarchy. Um, one of the most famous quotes from this time period, actually I don't know how famous it is, but I think it's really funny, is the first speaker of the new Italian parliament who said, we have now ma we have made Italy, now we need to make Italians. So you remember we've been speaking in class about this effort that nationalists made to, uh, to, to build a society in which everybody felt like they belonged to this single imagined community. And so things like anthems and flags and holidays and, and, and real and imagined heritage play a role in that. And, and that's what I always think of when I see this quote from the new speaker of the Italian parliament. So as promised, we're going to move on to Germany, which is another big example of, um, of the, the triumph of nationalism in the 19th century. And I showed you this map already, and as you can see, there is no single state of Germany. And instead, it's divided up into a lot of different states that have German-speaking people living in them. And the, the leader of the unification of Germany was the prime minister of Prussia, which was the most powerful of the German states. Um, he did not have romantic views about nationalism, um, and he didn't really care much about republicanism or, or democracy, what we call democracy now, which is what the revolutionaries in France had wanted and which what, you know, what Mazzini wanted and what many nationalists of an earlier era wanted. He wanted power for the German state. And so he was a practitioner of, of what, um, what he's known for real politic, which is politics that's based on practical and material matters rather than theory or ethics or idealistic notions of how humans can organize themselves on the planet. And uh, here's a picture of him, a kind of famous picture of him, and a very famous quote. This quote, the great questions of the day will not be settled by means of speeches and majority decisions, but by iron and blood. And by this he means speeches and majority decisions. These are the practices of, you know, representative government and what we now call democracy, you know, people, you know, making speeches and making arguments about something and then voting on it and the majority gets what they want. He doesn't care about that. He thinks what's really important is uh, iron and blood. And by this he means war and industry. Um, he makes a reference to the big mistake of 1848 and 49. And again, that's a reference to the revolutions throughout Europe that uh, had taken place, largely inspired by the nationalist visions that had been promoted and spread after and during the French Revolution. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, the unification of, of, um, of Germany took place, not unlike it did in Italy, with a series of conflicts and tensions with neighbors. It began up here in the north in Schleswig-Holstein, Schleswig -Holstein, which, uh, which were two members of the German Confederation, which had existed before, like 1815 it was created. And this was a confederation of d independent states that cooperated together. They were all German-speaking. And Schleswig and Holstein were members of the German Confederation. But Denmark, see Denmark up there? Denmark took them over, which... Prussia didn't like, and neither did Austria. So the two of them went to war together, and they kicked the Den, the, they kicked Denmark out of Schleswig and Holstein, and uh, they took them for themselves. They they each took one, and um, 1864 and 1865 is when that happened. Shortly after that, though, in 1866, and there was a reference before to the Prussia, the war between Austria and Prussia during the unification of of Italy, um, Prussia occupied Holstein, which was what was supposed to belong to Austria after they kicked Denmark out. You remember I said that they each took one? Well, Germany got Schleswig and Austria got Holstein. But then the Germans kicked the Austrians out of Holstein, and that began what's called the Seven-Week War, which the Prussians won. 
And later on, you're going to be reading some memoirs from Bismarck about how, um, how calculated he was when he was thinking about how to do that, uh, engage in that conflict with Austria. But that's, um, uh, but that's what he did. So now we've got, Heis, uh, we've got Holstein and Schleswig, um, you know, the Prussians have taken them over. But it wasn't just that smooth, because what happened was when the Prussians went into Holstein, it was really a power play, because at that point, nationalism was really in the air everywhere throughout Europe. Now, what's going on is both Austria and Prussia are both pretty powerful in the German Confederation, and they're sort of rivals for who would be the leader of this newly united Germany should it actually be created. So that's one of the reasons that, that Prussia, Bismarck, wanted to go into Holstein, because he wanted to make, you know, he wanted to assert Prussian supremacy over Austria. But not everybody agreed that Prussia was the right, um, the right leader for this unification. So some of the other um, members of the German, German uh, Confederation, like Bavaria and Saxony, they actually sided with Austria. And what ended up happening was, that, like I said, the Prussians won. And, um, he, and I, Bismarck actually dissolved the German Confederation, created the, quote, North German Confederation. And uh, in 1866, that's when that happened. In 1870, the southern portion of what is now Germany ends up becoming a part of Germany. And this was in consequence of the Franco-Prussian War, which actually was um, uh, about something else. It was about succession to the Spanish throne. But Prussia, um, you know, the, the, the southern German states were actually involved in that. And so Prussia and the North German Confederation actually supported those southern um, those those southern con those southern states in their battle with France, and they won, and Germany became united as an empire in 1871. The, the the one of the main points that you should take away from both of these examples, and particularly the German example, is that um, neither of these states were created as republics. One was created as a constitutional monarchy, Italy, and the other was created as an empire. And this, both of these examples are illustrative of the sort of morphing, the, the movement of, of nationalism from a liberal um, political force to a more conservative one that is less interested in the, you know, equality and fraternity and liberty that were the slogans of the French Revolution um, and more interested in the building of state Power, building and maintenance of state power, I should say. And this is especially the case in Germany, which very quickly became a state whose military power and rapid economic growth, remember the blood and iron, iron portion of Bismarck's, uh, Bismarck's quote, um, it was very threatening to other European states. And this will be really important because what happens over the next half century, well, less than half century, between 1871 and the creation of Germany, um, and 1914 is very much about that rivalry and those tensions around the rapid growth of German power. Okay, so takeaway message. Uh, Germany and Italy are held up as two examples of the triumph of nationalism uh, in the 19th century. There, you, you find sections about these two things in textbooks everywhere. Well, textbooks about world history and European history. You find sections dedicated to these two particular case studies. And the other takeaway message is that uh, they also represent the kind of transfer, the, the, the more conservative direction that um, nationalism starts to take in the mid-19th century as political leaders learn that they could use nationalism to rally people behind a much stronger state power. And that becomes really big as we move toward imperialism and eventually the First World War. That's it. We'll be talking about this in class. Thanks.